Good morning to all our guests and uh, good morning or good evening to a visitor in Asia. Um, we have a warm welcome to our artist talk here with Paul Fegeschöld and Jana Bruckmann. Um, it's my great pleasure to present our two guests who have many in common and many interests together. And since our Last Zoom exchange, they met for the second time live. Jana Bruckmann is a researcher, art critic, curator, and a researcher. She's living in Lucerne. She's finalizing her doctorate thesis with the title, The Planet Earth Seen from the Space, A History of Image, Knowledge, in the 20th century of Germany. The project focused on visual depictions of Earth seen from outer space from the end of the 19th century to the renowned photograph Blue Marble from Apollo 17 in 1972. We will have the pleasure to see some picture of her collection today. She has been recently appointed as curator at the Art Museum in Niedwalden in Stanz. Hello and welcome, Jana. Hello. Paul Fegeschöld is among the foremost Swedish painters working today. He was educated at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm and at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. After living in New York some years, he got rewarded with the Oke Andrean Foundation's art grant in 2018. And I had the pleasure to meet him then and have a studio visit. And it was a fantastic encounter, which we see here, the works today. Paul has exhibited widely in galleries in Europe and USA, and his work is found in significant collections in museums and institutions. It's his first show in Switzerland here in Thun, and uh, it's his first big museum exhibition. And least but not least, he's coming from a family of painters, so his grandfather and his father are famous painter in Sweden. This is very important to know. So for warm up, I would like to start with Paul. And uh, what was different for you to prepare an exhibition like this and then the other exhibition you had before? Uh, it, to begin with, it's nice to be the warm-up. That's, <laughs> that's nice. Um, but um, I think a lot of things were different. Uh, I have never done a show of this magnitude. Um, and the short, rather short, short notice, we started talking in October. And it would have been impossible to do a show with completely new works. So we had to kind of find a balance between loaning works and um, uh, making you know, some important new ones at the same time as having a focus within the exhibition. Um, I think it felt quite naturally on focusing towards landscape in this exhibition. What I've been working most with the last years. Um, the latest works are in the room over there um, and are based on what the sky would, will look like and ha have looked like at the certain uh, periods of time and situations. Uh, well, the title is very important. The title is Blue Marble and I think this is a key word to jump over to Jana's thesis and uh, I give her the mic. <laughs> Yeah, first of all, thank you both for the invitation and the friendly introduction. 
I'm very happy to be here. As you said, Helen, Paul and I have some overlapping interests. And I find that especially appealing because we look at, the similar, at similar topics from different perspectives. Paul as an artist and I, in this case, as a historian. But I'm going to give you a quick look at my research before we get into details and start our conversation. My doctoral project is entitled The Planet is Seen from Space, a History of Image and Knowledge in 20th Century Germany. The starting point of my research were the famous space photographs Earthrise and Blue Marble. You can see them here screened on the wall. Earthrise was taken during the flight of Apollo 8 in December 1968. Today, this image is considered an icon, not least because there is a specific story connected with it. The story told today says that the astronauts were completely surprised by the view of Earth. Because, so the argument goes, nobody was interested in images of the Earth. Instead, all interested was directed towards the Moon. Then, with Earthrise, everything changed. All of a sudden, interest shifted from the Moon back to the Earth, because it became clear that the most precious, most beautiful and most important is our own planet. As said, that's the story as it has been told today. For example, in 2018, on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 8 mission, National Geographic produced a short film about Earthrise and explained, the famous Christmas Eve snapshot took 90 seconds to make and kick off five decades of awareness of our planet's beauty and fragility. And the NZZ, Neue Zürcher Zeitung, titled Sie suchen den Mond und finden die Erde. They searched the moon and found the earth. Without a doubt, this is a compelling story. But it, is it actually true? Well, I propose to re-examine it. Because it is often overlooked that representing the Earth as seen from space has a long tradition in Western imagination. Verbal descriptions of the Earth as seen from space can be traced back to antiquity. Research on the genealogy of the whole Earth motif shows that the perspective from space was not the result of American or Soviet space exploration, but instead had already been widespread in the Western world since the second half of the 19th century. At least a century before the renowned photographs Earthrise and Blue Marble were taken, astronomers, geographers, engineers, novelists and filmmakers imagined and depicted the Earth as seen from space. We see here some examples from around 1900. They had been published in popular astronomy books. And this is only a, lit, a very um, small selection of images. You can see here. The fields I'm interested in or where you can find this image is popular astronomy, science fiction, theater, film, and also astronautics. On the basis of these observations, I show that visual depictions of the Earth as seen from space have a long tradition in Western imagination, predating the astronauts' visual encounter with the Earth by far. That means that I have been collecting images to create a genealogy of the subject. Therefore, I have been looking at a period of 100 years, starting at the end of the 19th century, and ending in the 1970s. I claim that Earth was not discovered in a specific moment during the Apollo 8 mission. Rather, I'm aiming at describing a long process of transition in the nature of the image which people hold of their dwelling place, themselves and their earthly and cosmic environment. Also, I consider this image as key to the understanding of the Earth. 
In other words, I don't just collect the images, I use them to find out what people knew and thought about the Earth at the given time. In this way, I have discovered various continuities as well as breaks in the understanding of the Earth. One of the most important drivers of changing perceptions were the sciences. They massively changed our understanding of the planet. This is still true today, as the pictures are primarily used to, and related to environmental issues. Nevertheless, and that's the last point before <laughs> I end this presentation, um, nevertheless, depictions of the Earth were not only used to communicate factual knowledge, reflecting the place and role of our planet and mankind in the universe, they were used to promote a variety of different concepts based on the current level of knowledge as well as on political interests and differing world views. Thus, I consider such images as indicators of change in knowledge and perception of the Earth in the long 20th century. And I think that's also a good point to, to start our conversation, Paul. Um, you choose the title um, Blue Marble for your exhibition. Can you maybe say something about this choice? Mm. I think a lot of my uh, work relates both to photography and to representation in, in different forms. And Blue Marble is a very good kind of met metaphorical title. It's, it has this very kind of minimalistic um, uh, kind of um, uh, con content. I mean, it's a, it's a very dense uh, way of speaking of about how we create meaning in the world and uh, how we, through referring to other things, define something. Um, I think, I mean, the, there's a lot of astronomical references in this show. Uh, and the last work uh, finished for this show was a work that also includes an a image of the Earth uh, taken from um, or within a painting depicting what the night sky will look like on Mars, uh, 1st of January 2100, looking towards Earth. That's the big reddish painting in the other uh, room. Um, no, it, it felt like something that, the title felt like something that walked hand in hand with what I thought about the work and the exhibition. It's interesting that you mentioned this image with uh, the change of perspective where we look from Mars to the Earth because I think one cannot recognize the planet as Earth. <laughs> it's no. just a point, it's just a spot at the sky. And also I will switch some foils here. Oh. This is also um, been produced much earlier. You can see it on the right side. There is a view of the Earth from Mars, <laughs> and it's the boldest star at the night sky of Mars, because people then were very fascinated by Mars because they thought that there are canals built by intelligent Martian beings, <laughs> and you can see it here. It's a newspaper article from 1924. It's during the opposition of Mars. Then Mars was very close to the Earth. One con uh, could see it better than in other phases. And they tried to, to find out if there are really canals all on Mars built by other beings. And it was kind of a riddle. Most astronomers didn't believe in that, but some did. And it was kind of a huge thing in the press. And the year 1877, uh, the picture on the right, was made in that year where um, the first time somebody said he saw canals on the mouse. And what is especially interesting here is the vegetation. You can see that there are trees and palms, and you see water beneath and the sun going down. So they thought that there are lakes and uh, very vivid life on Mars. And this, of course, changed them very dramatically. But maybe you can, or maybe this is also from Venus. It's the <laughs> same thing. <laughs> 
Am Himmel der Venus ist unsere Erde ein Stern von magischem Glanz. It's from, also from a newspaper of the 1920s. Hmm. Um, you said that you are very much interested also in this astronomical knowledge. Is it a thing that interests you since a long time? And yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I think the first thing I did after finishing school was to take a summer course in, in that at the university. No, but my lack of math capabilities uh, keep it, you know, more distant. Um, absolutely, I, I think there is this. It's a parallel uh, of um, sorts between science and, and art, and perhaps religion as well. Where, where the thing that you're looking at is not the important thing, but what you add to it, and within kind of astronomical things, it's this kind of thing of looking at something and getting more than what you actually see is, is quite present. Uh, I mean, um, or interpreting knowledge or interpreting, you know, uh, what, um, the facts or what, what is there. Um, I think in, in that regard, this Starry night images that I've made are, I think what is not in them is what is in, interesting. Uh, you know, and I can use one mathematical and, and very scientifically based application in order to find the right position of constellations and stars. But in order to kind of, because the scale is so vast, uh, but in order to, paint, you know, what the Earth will look like in, in um, Ten years, it's very difficult on, on the level of human beings uh, because we change every day and our society changes drastically over the course of 100 years. So maybe you can say something about the story program because this is, a, I don't know, I think the public does, don't know really all mm. about it. So it would be very interesting how you use it or mm. how you start to use it. For a long time, it had been uh, kind of a note in my, in my sketchbook uh, to make a picture of a future sky because I realized that the calculations or the um, predictions are are there. It's possible to foresee how uh, movements of stars uh, take place. Um, so last year, I kind of wanted to do works based on that, and I asked. Uh, the astronomy department at the University in Stockholm about advice and they suggested a couple of programs. Uh, Starry Night is one of the most kind of um, the one that functions best for me. It it's, feels like you can be both a very basic amateur and a, um, <laughs> professional using it. Um, and then, there you can basically type in your location and the time in which you're looking and then you can, you know, pan around and look up and down and zoom in on things. Um, so then I typed in the location of places and times where I wanted to be able to see the sky. And I used those kind of renderings to, to make the, the paintings. Um, of course there's, I mean, every time you move from one medium to another, uh, there's things that are lost in translation or interpretation. Um, and you make choices that fit painting uh, well, because it's like that's the f field I'm working or doing the works in. Uh, and then um, it becomes a matter of, of um, how do adjustments in order to make the painting as good as possible. Um, and what was um, important in, in relation to Vincent van Gogh's Story Night? Mm. A landscape that you choose him or that you picked up this um, iconic painting? Big, um, what was important? Um, or what was your interest? In I, I think picture? as a painter or a colleague the interest is, is there all along. I really like the work and then it's one of those works that's been with you, with me since I was young. Uh, and, and we know which window he looked out of from the monastery at what, what night, at what time, and then you can basically program it and, and get you a chance to paint the same sky. 
uh, I, I mean from painterly or artistic um, you know um, uh, position and it w was quite fun to do it um, and uh, all the other skies are skies that I want to see even if, I mean, even, even if I can't because one of them is uh, looking south uh, in Stockholm year 100,000 in the future uh, that's kind of impossible to look at except for in a painting or in a rendering and I think painting has advantages uh, against towards I mean in comparison to the digital application it just remains a kind of um, tool when I'm looking at it I, I don't relate to it neither physically or um, in other ways it's just kind of flat uh, but every kind of time it turns into a painting it's kind of you look at it as ha having been filtered through somebody's perception and therefore it kind of gains magnitude uh, even if no one of us has been there or probably won't be there in, in a 98,000 years uh, we it has this kind of you know uh, thing of having been filtered through uh, perception uh, that you know kind of equates being there. Um, two of the other ones are historical. Uh, one is from Lascaux cave uh, and one is from Stonehenge and it's also we know that people at those locations looked at the sky uh, and because of the you know, on Stonehenge the, the correlation between uh, the summer solstice and, and the formation of the rocks we know that those times were important, so we don't know much more, or we can kind of try to figure out. But it's that part is not painted in the painting. Yeah. But what is your fascination? I mean, we are, we, we we show all these paintings here, and and um, when we when we watch it, we see this the the story night. But uh, we can only discover um, your intention through the title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no. I mean, um, to some extent, I think reality is like that. <laughs> it's just that we forget that we have stuff, two things. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, regarding those, my intentions are that I want to see those landscapes uh, or those skies. That's it's probably as I don't know if it's egoistic because it's shared, but I mean, at least the core of it is that I want to to see it. Uh, and the reason for that, um, mm, I mean, that's probably quite banal. We are deadly human beings, and we, we have a limited time span. Uh, I, did, I went here for 3,500 years ago, and it would be kind of need to proceed. It. You, you, you said something very interesting before um, regarding um, the things you can see or not to see in the, the painting. You're more interested in the things you can't see in the paintings yeah. than you can see. In, in those, absolutely, because it's it's the, again this clash of time spans. Um, there are things, the painted things in those paintings are possible to vision because it's this time scale which is possible through math and science and, and rational thinking to kind of get a grasp of. Uh, everything on our level, I mean, predicting the weather seven days ahead is, is quite difficult because it's so chaotic. Getting more and more difficult. <laughs> yeah, potentially, yes. Uh, so, I mean, the unpainted thing in those paintings are us, I guess, are whether or not we're there, whether or not <laughs> we in the future ones are you know, mm, doing well or not so well. <laughs> you want to add something? Um? Yeah, well, the, yeah, no. the thing I thought when I saw these um, Starry Nights images or paintings, I, um, I think it's triggering the imagination very much because I was asking myself, does it matter um, where the stars are positioned at the uh, night sky? 
does this position say us something about Stockholm in the past and the future? And aren't we like entering the field of astrology by asking these questions? But I think what you are interested in is this huge time span we cannot grasp yeah. and that we try to figure out where we come from and where we are going to and what yeah. the current state is in the present we live in. Yeah. And I think that's kind of triggering in, in, when I look at these images, <coughs> although I don't think that the stars really say something about us. No. <laughs> it's, it's us trying to make sense. Yeah. about uh, our place in the universe. And um, I think it's somehow a bit paradoxical even because we, we give uh, the star constellations some names and try to make sense of these same constellations um, of our existence. So if you take a horoscope or something, they tell you about uh, your character and your future, maybe you are in a good position or not, things like that. So we try to make sense of our existence here. And I think that's something that becomes obvious in, obvious in these paintings. Yeah. Searching for meaning. Uh, you, 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 you nailed it. Uh, uh, that, there's, uh, that's, the, that's the best I've heard. <laughs> yes. uh, mm. I don't know what to add from that. That's exactly what things are. But I have an, another question. We talked on a Zoom, and I think the first time we talked, we talked also about dinosaurs. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the past of, of the Earth, and I think you had some some little dinosaurs in your studio. Yeah, yeah. Not, no. <laughs> I, I think some is a grave understatement. Um, some is. <laughs> um, um, but. No, but it's it's wonderful with those creatures because they, you when when I grew up in the 90s, um, Jurassic Park was new and and there was this whole idea about you know now we have a scientific idea about what they were actually like and and they changed from being bipedal to being quadrupeds and they or, and the opposite depending on which species they were uh, and and people talked about it with certainty. Uh, and now, 20 years later, or 30, um, they are completely different again. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were spoken of with the same certainty. Uh, it's, the, it's kind of interesting how they in themselves don't change. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, you know, they, they remain the same since they passed. Uh, but our perception of it changes mm -hmm. uh, with the same certainty every, every time. <laughs> Which is, yeah, I like that. It's, it's very beautiful somehow. It's, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I found it very interesting and that you have one image, I think it's in that room, um, called Giant. <laughs> and it looks so harmless. It's only um, a, no, a red uh, circle. And together with this title and fr in front of the background of ast astronomical thinking, I thought about the sun <laughs> becoming a red giant and this means it's the end of our solar system and the end of life in our solar system. So it's kind of a huge thing. Yeah. It's really <laughs> harmless yeah. uh, image, but I don't know if uh, uh, my fantasy is running away with me or if you were actually no. thinking about yeah, the sun ab ab as a absolutely. Red giant. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> it's also fun with the, with the scaling because when yeah. it's a red giant, if you compare it to other Star, stars or siblings or relatives of the sun, then, then it's, it won't even be that big. It, our, our kind of end is quite you know, uh, sm small in comparison to other ends in the, or other stars. Or well, coming back to, to Earth and uh, coming back to a very important theme <laughs> here and in your work, um, uh, landscape. I think this, I, I would like to. Um, talk about it uh, as a, maybe as a, as a first, as a last topic in your, in your discussion. Uh, landscape is so important for us because we have a, a big collection with a focus of landscape here, the Swiss, uh, Swiss art. Um, and secondly, for our guests here 
who have been here for the first time, you have discovered maybe the mountains and it's an idle landscape where many painters came, like uh, Hodler or Paclet. They were painting or house mountain, the Neeson, is a very symbolic mountain, so landscape plays a very important role for us in here in the museum. And we have also Albrecht Schneider who has joined us. He's uh, the second painter here who is showing his solo show. Also about landscape, which is a very important focus. I just want to say hello, Albrecht. Very great, nice that you came to our talk. And you, of course, Paul, you have a, um, the landscape also as a, as a main theme or as a main thought in your, in your work. And I would maybe start um, with asking you, how can we paint landscape today in the Anthropocene era and being relevant? Hmm. Maybe, yes, maybe you can give us some <laughs> um, ideas or how do you um, handle the question? Mm, I, think, I think Albrecht said it good in the presentation here, uh, yeah, or at the opening, um, that it's a good thing to practice painting around. Uh, I think we have a multitude of possibilities in, in choosing which kind of foot to stand on, whether or not you go at it semiotically or symbolically, investigating the borders in what is actually a landscape. Uh, and differently, you can kind of go at it and, and just, you know, in the, in the form of the historical, you know, language of landscape painting. Um, on my part, I, I think it's kind of interesting just thinking about landscape as the milieu in which you live. Uh, we obviously are a part of the milieu in which we live. We change it and has been, have been doing so since, you know, um, prehistory. Uh, we change, we choose animals that we like and we choose animals we dislike. We choose, you know, um, to plant seeds at a certain location and, and burn forests at others. Um, so somehow including us in the landscape has been you know, something that I've been quite interested in. Uh, because I think it's difficult to see, we kind of use terms as, as natural and um, nature as something which is there without us and that we kind of can grasp with means of you know, language and, and science, I guess, or just by looking clearly, and I think it's quite difficult to do so. I think we add language or imagery to the place we're in, and I think depending on how we look, we, we get that language back. I don't know. You use a lot of uh, metaphors for landscape, like, um, like stars, moon, horizontal line. Yeah, I think our visual language is based on landscape, and then so is our language. Our language is based on, on metaphors, metaphors that kind of don't need to be recognizable metaphors yet, still, uh, because we kind of uh, have developed language so much. But I mean, it's say, like saying the sun goes up or down, or, or it's, um, um, how do you call it? And that's, it's a very simple metaphor, but I think most of language are based on similar metaphors. Uh, basically things that kind of reconnect to landscape and, and things that are around us uh, and don't need to be conscious anymore. Yeah. I don't know if that answered the question. Yes, but do you have a kind of a romantic approach also to your landscape? I mean... Uh, uh, pr probably more than I want, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, because... Um, Seeing on, on your painting, you, you really get, I mean, also the monumental paintings where we are sitting here, you really get into it, you really are attracted of, a, of the, into the landscape. I mean, if you compare now with Kaspar Friedrich, he was always painting himself, you see him in the yeah, back. Yeah. But now we are the, the figure, we are the viewer outside. I think you said it quite well. I think what I, if you take any kind of Kaspar David Friedrich painting where you have the back, of somebody looking at something, kind of wanted to take an exacto knife between 
that figure and the landscape and make it so that there is no kind of stage on which the painting takes place, but it's kind of hovering between the canvas and the viewer with no, you're not looking at something which has kind of internal relationships or looking at somebody else looking at something. It's more about a kind of one-to-one -one relationship between the viewer and what is painted. Um, and I guess um, in terms of a, that type of romance, I, I, we are all that figure in the Kaspar David Friedrich painting. Or, so. Would you want to add something, Jana, or to that? Well, I was just wondering, where am I standing as a viewer? Because am I flying through space <laughs> or am I on a solid ground? It depends on, <laughs> the, the, depends on which painting, I think, and then depends on your reading. Uh, in some of them, I think multiple readings are possible. Um, I think since it's a two-dimensional medium and everything is negotiations, there's one type, if, if we just speak of one painting, there's one type of painting when you're in front of it, like, you know, 32 centimeters to a meter, and there's a different meet, painting a few meters away. It moves from a distance being a painting which has a um, clear edge marked by, by a frame uh, stating the end of the image. Uh, it moves from being a graphical shape to being a kind of in, how do you call it, embracing, uh, not reality, but something which has a more pictorial <laughs> space. Um, I think that kind of movement or participation from the viewer, uh, and speaking of the viewer, I, I am also a viewer. I kind of do them and then I, I do the same thing myself. I kind of try to figure things out. Um, that, that movement is a very big part of it. And the, uh, I guess it was on that for doing it. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I like that very much. That it's it's not a thing that is set, but that the viewer can like interpret it differently. If I see this as a horizontal line, then I'm maybe standing on a solid ground. If I don't see it like that, then I would have to zoom in on one of the stars to have a landscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To see a landscape, I have to zoom in. And I think what's also interesting is that where you have this huge amount of black paint or different colors, mm -hmm. uh, layers, actually there is nothing. Yeah. And it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah. The vacuum. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And where the stars are, there is the, 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 the material, but on your painting, it's the other way around. Yeah. There is nothing in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's again the whole thing of having something to practice painting around where you have to make choices that make uh, both, both are right for the painting, but also kind of right in what you're depicting. I think that movement between flatness and, and form. Uh, that you do when you kind of like this, uh, you know, the degrees of 10, the video when you zoom out by 10 all the time and then zoom in, it, it, all, it moves from being like a, a solid two-dimensional or flat thing towards being something completely different. Um, I think it's really fun that you mentioned that the, the thing, uh, you know, the, the immaterial thing is the thing that is material in, in the paintings. Uh, it's, that's, that's true, absolutely. Oh, on the other hand, actually, we don't know, since there's a lot of things in space we don't know what it is. Um, so, so but, we, yeah. sorry. No, no. no. So we, we have spoken about the past and the, and the future. Um, now I would like to know about your future projects, Paul. Um, after landscape, is there something new we can expect from you? <laughs> um, and to, to <laughs> yeah, how do you call it? There's m many things to practice painting around, uh, but um, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I mean, now I'm con so. I think there. I, I, I was taught one time: if you're in the woods and you get lost, you should carry a very big, long stick. Uh, that's you know two meters back and two meters forward because you. Don't, it keeps you from walking in circles and makes it more like easy to kind of stay, stay the course. Um, and 
somehow this exhibition is that stick uh, with the present and, and uh, 10 years back. The earliest work in this show is done 2010. Uh, and regarding the stick into the, the part of the stick that goes into the future, I'm, I'm not certain, but the, the now, which is represented by the Starry Night paintings, is probably continuing for another couple of exhibitions. And there's, you know, mysteries in it that I want to continue with. Um, um, I mean, speaking of the future, I, I think the works that I'm doing now, uh, when I get back to the studio, are based on what the starry night, the night sky would look like year 2100. Uh, because it's the, when you do a painting that's done representing what it would look like in 100,000 years, it's, it's so vast that we can't have a, I, I can't get a physical relationship to the time. If you choose something which is done eight years forward in time, we get a physical, I have a, I hope to be alive, uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, with a greater, you know, predictability, hopefully my children will be. Mm -hmm. And, and so you have a kind of relationship to the time. Uh, so that's that's something I'm working on now. Uh, then let's see. There's you know, other mysteries within painting that would be fun to practice painting around. Uh, portraits would be fun, but I have yes. absolutely absolutely <laughs> that, no idea how to jump. <laughs> absolutely no idea how to do that. Yeah, but that would be fun. That would be fun. I think. Uh... Then we are back to the stars, no? With the portraits. <laughs> With yes, we, we had this conversation that, in a way, when you told us that um, you're planning to maybe do some portraits in the future, that if you look at the starry night image and you think in the terms um, of astrology, in a way, these are portraits for some people. They say something about yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a person, but it's just. Um, Speculative. Yeah, that's fun. We should walk through with the <laughs> astrologist yes. and see what kind of people are painted. <laughs> yeah, there. Mm, that's a good. Then um, I thank you very much both of uh, taking your time and uh, and having a very interesting conversation. And uh, of course, I thank you very much also for your concentration. Yeah. It's not so easy with a mask and. Uh, I know that it means a lot of, for us that you are here today. And the poll shows is last until August 15. And there will be a catalog also, who will be published soon. So we are looking very much forward. And um, yes, I would like to wish you a very nice Sunday afternoon and our friends who are somewhere in Asia, Japan. I know there are some guests here. Um, I wish them a good night. And I thank you to, we, to be with us today. Very, th very thank you very much. And you. not to forget, I really found out we have also a flag with a star here in Thun. Yeah. <laughs> so you. there is a special small gift yeah. for Thanks more stars in your life. Yeah. <laughs> thank Appreciate you both of you. Thank you. Thank you.